Welcome back to Bay's Bible. We are now in the second half of the liturgical year, otherwise known as the season after Pentecost or ordinary time, in which the Holy Spirit guides the church into all truth. Over the next dozen weeks or so, we are going to be looking at the historical books of the Hebrew Bible, that is 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, in an allegorical way concerning Christ's teaching on the kingdom of God. Last week, we looked at how the kingdom of God is related to power. But this week, we're going to focus on the perceptibility of the kingdom of God. How and where can we expect to see the kingdom of God. Now, over the past couple weeks, we saw Christ ascend into the heavens. We saw the Holy Spirit come and give people the power to speak in tongues. And then we also had this image of Christ binding the strong man. So, we, you know, probably couldn't find much fault if we thought that the kingdom of God always came with opulent wealth, grandiose displays of beauty, or invincible might. But, what we will actually find this week is that God is least likely to work in those places and rather works among that which is small. At the very beginning of the historical books of the Hebrew Bible, the prophet Samuel's mother, Hannah, she gives a song of thanksgiving to God for the birth of her son, in which she says, The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. We should expect then that the kingdom of God will work not among those on the top of society's ladder, but rather on the bottom. And in order to see this work, it might take an entirely different set of eyes to see. And why might, be, why might this be the case, that God will actually be more likely to be found in the working of the lowly and the small than the highly exalted and powerful? Well, th think of it this way. If you've ever had to fundraise, for instance, for a project, like we at Base Bible are trying to fundraise through Patreon, check the link below. In terms of fundraising for a project, you know that there is a huge difference between having a few donors that donate a lot of money on their own versus having a lot of donors that each individually donate a little bit. Even though the amounts might be the same, they say very different things. Why? Because if your project is only funded by a couple of very wealthy donors, it means that yes, while it, the, the project is getting off the ground, it's only doing so because the forces of wealth and privilege and success are working behind it. Whereas if you have a lot of really small level donors, behind you, it means that while the amount might be the same and your project still might get off the ground, it's rather based on widespread love of the project. Well, likewise, if God only funded that, if God only supported that, which was super powerful and opulent and successful already, then we might question, eh, did God really have anything to do with their success, you know? Whereas, if God works among the lowly and the dispossessed of this world, then when it does succeed, we can attribute its success to none other than the power of God behind them. And this is why we can expect our God to be a God of small things. For some of the historical and narrative background of, of First and Second Samuel, I highly recommend that you check out our episodes from Advent 4 as well as Epiphany 2, in which we cover the narrative and historical background of these books in some detail. 
But for this week's passage, we actually have to cover some of the narrative in between last week's passage and this week's passage. For in between those two are two very important stories of King Saul's own disobedience and insubordination to the prophet Samuel. One, King Saul decides that he's going to perform Samuel's function of sacrificing. So here we have the political usurping the role of the religious. But then we also see how King Saul fails to fulfill his own political duties and and leaving the king of the Amalekites alive and leaving the prophet Samuel to have to finish the job. Okay, so both of these things result in the end of King Saul's dynasty as well as his own removal from the throne. It's not a very happy picture that we come here for King Saul. Now, as Keith Bodner has pointed out in his work, in his narrative commentary, there's actually quite a lot of narrative brilliance in 1st and 2nd Samuel, and especially here in the anointing of King David. For the anointing of David is contrasted in some very important ways with the anointing of King Saul. One is that King Saul was noted for his stature. He was head above all the other Israelites. So he's a very tall man. Whereas what we can assume from David's contrast with his brothers, that David is probably not of this similar hulking Adonis kind of a man that King Saul was. Number two, King Saul, before he is anointed, is actually sent to Samuel. Whereas in this passage, Samuel is sent to David. Thirdly, when we witness King Saul get anointed, uh, Samuel just used a simple vial. Whereas for David, he uses a horn. And thus, Samuel fulfills the prophecy of his mother Hannah, who in her song of thanksgiving said that the Lord would anoint his chosen one, give strength to the king, and exalt his horn. So here we go. We have Samuel's life and his narrative almost coming to its proper fulfillment. But the amazing thing about this story, really, given that it's about such an important character as King David, is that we don't actually learn David's name until the very end of the story. It actually centers on the prophet Samuel. Now, you may remember from our episode in Epiphany 2, when Samuel was just a young boy under Eli, that the problem there was faulty hearing. He mistook the voice of the Lord for the voice of Eli. Well, here, as he closes his end of his personal story, the problem is not faulty hearing, but faulty perception, faulty sight. In fact, it's so bad that God basically has to say, okay, Samuel, you are going to anoint the one that I am going to show you. Okay? So in other words, God has to handhold Samuel through this process. Samuel is given no freedom as a prophet of God to discern this for himself. And we could see why, because he immediately jumps the gun and assumes that it's Eliab, the oldest of Jesse's sons, who is also tall and full of stature and an Adonis of a man like King Saul was. And Samuel assumes, well, that's got to be the guy, right? You could see what's happening here. The prophet Samuel is using the same old paradigm for choosing a king that him and God have already rejected, right? What God is looking for is obedience. And all Samuel is focused on is the stature of the man. He has a faulty perception of what is really important here. And so what we can see is that the imperceptibility of the kingdom of God and of its smallness and how it really works is, is so out side of human sight that God even has to hold the hand of his own prophet to see what it's supposed to be. And if the human radar for where God is working is so far off, then we should be very wary of assuming that our vision of the kingdom of God is God's own.
popular phrase, God save the Queen. While it does come from the Book of Common Prayer of the Church of England, that same prayer book's inspiration for that prayer comes directly from our psalm. But, amazingly enough, historically, this psalm really isn't used to support emperors and monarchies until the Carolinian dynasty of Charlemagne in the 8th and 9th centuries. Despite the fact that it seems really well suited to support monarchies, as the ancient context of our psalm suggests that it's a prayer uh, for the king's own military victory. You know, we have the first five verses of our psalm that read as a petition to God for the king's success. Then we have verses 6 to 8, which seem to be the king's own self-assuredness that God is with him. Then finally we get back in verse 9 to a final petition of the people. So how are we to use this psalm exactly if it's not praying for a particular war effort or to support our country in some kind of battle? You know, and, and especially in light of the confusion that we've seen between the religious and the political duties and roles of the king and the priest that we saw in King Uzziah on Trinity Sunday, as well as in our passage this week with King Saul and Samuel, these mixing up of these roles, I think it's really, really important that we actually try to discern a religious purpose for this psalm, given how well it seems to be suited for political purposes. And for our reading here, we're really going to focus on verse 9, which our Jewish brothers and sisters have actually done a really great favor in helping us focus on the Hebrew rendering of this verse rather than their Greek and Latin translations. Because in the Hebrew, this is how verse 9 reads. God deliver the king, answer us when we call. Now, while in Greek and Latin translations, along with many English ones, we get the rendering, may God deliver the king, may he answer us when we call, something like that. But the Hebrew can be, not must be, but it can read, God will deliver us, the king will answer us when we call. So is the king a separate person that God is going to save in the battle, or is God the king who is going to save us in the battle. And in fact, it actually amazes me that there has not been more debate about how to properly translate this verse, given how stark differently the meanings are. I mean, we, we do get the impression already in verse 6 that yes, God is going to save the military figure of the king. But then, especially given how in verse 7 we are given a contrast between trusting in military might and trusting in our God, I think this actually pushes us to reach in verse 9 as a prayer not that God will save the king, because God is going to do that, they're assured of that already, but rather that we are to place our ultimate faith and trust in God rather than in our militarism, because God will fight our battle. I think that's how it should actually push us in a religious context. So it can be used for political purposes, but this is really its spiritual content, is to trust God even above our ornaments. And I think, you know, a short takeaway that we might have from this passage at all is to see the victory of God's kingdom. Right? We could still see it as a prayer for God's will and victory to be done. In fact, we have a 6th century Roman senator and Christian author, Cassidorus, who in his commentary on the psalm really brings to light a religious purpose for this psalm that I think might help us solve our linguistic mystery as well. The Father is urged to save the King. In other words, let Christ the Lord rise from the dead, ascend into heaven, and intercede for us. Thus our prayer may no longer waver, rather we may presume to pray with him as our advocate, who taught us to pray to the Father that the noose of death may not bind us. So in the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom.
In our passage last week from St. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, we saw him looking for that not which can be seen, but what cannot be seen, alluding to our lesson this week about the perceptibility of the kingdom of God. We saw how St. Paul was looking past the ever-changing sufferings of his present life in his temporary dwelling, his temporary tent, as he looked forward to a more permanent dwelling of a building not made with hands. And in this week, he takes that argument a little bit further as he talks about his motivations in order to answer his rivals at the church at Corinth that seem to be denouncing him based upon the appearance of his sufferings. Well, St. Paul really goes much further. In verse 12, he seems to clearly echo the language from 1 Samuel about judging by the heart and not by appearances. And then in verse 16, he goes even further. He says, listen, we used to judge Christ by the flesh or by appearances, but now we know him by the heart or by the spirit. We know the truth of him. Okay. Now we have to understand exactly what Paul is getting at here. And for this, we're going to need a little bit of the ancient Greek philosophical background, which um, some academic biblical scholars in the early 20th century really missed out on. There was uh, a fashionable opinion in early academic biblical studies in the early 1900s that what Paul meant here by we, have, we used to know Christ according to the flesh, but now we don't, is that Paul is giving up on the historical Jesus and now believes in the Christ of faith. That what Paul is here denying is any knowledge about Jesus as a real historical human being that was in the flesh, and now they really know Christ by the Spirit. You know, he's a spiritual being. But of course, this is wrong. As W.D. Davies points out in his book, Paul and Rabbitic Judaism, Paul here is not talking about the content of what is known, but rather the method by which it is known. And in order to get this, we really have to look at an ancient Greek philosophical premise that was basic to a lot of ancient thought and that Second Temple Judaism, which St. Paul was steeped in, also adopted, which is the basic premise that visual perception does not constitute true knowledge. In other words, to know something by means of the flesh, by mere visual perception, is not true knowledge. Okay? What constitutes true knowledge is to perceive it at the level of the heart or the level of the intellect. So St. Paul here is not denying that Jesus was ever a historical human being. Rather, what he's saying is, guys, we used to judge even Jesus by appearances. We judged him as a condemned criminal on the cross. But now we have true knowledge of who he was, the resurrected king of glory. And this is not a knowledge based upon appearances. For appearances can be deceiving and appearances can be faulty. But we know this at the level, at a truer level, of the intellect. And St. Paul is essentially correlating that with his own suffering. You know, he's saying, in defending his apostleship, you might judge me by these mere appearances of how poor and beaten up I am. But really, I am an apostle. And you know this at the level of your intellect or your heart, despite appearances. Now, in our day, I know it can be difficult, especially when a lot of our criminal trials are dependent upon cell phone videos. And they say, trust your eyes, trust your perception. To say, actually, your visual perception is not enough and it does not constitute true knowledge. And we all know, based upon even an optical illusion, that visual perception can be faulty. So the thing that we're to take away from here is that even if we cannot see the kingdom of God's success in the world, even if we can't perceive it at a visual level, that's okay, because visual perception does not constitute true knowledge. We are looking for that which cannot be seen, the level of knowledge at the heart, in which we can be really confident, because that actually constitutes a truer knowledge than mere perception.
In between last week's passage from the Gospel of Mark and this week's, we see that Jesus continues to use parables like the binding of the strong man. However, crucial to understand in Jesus' use of parables is his quotation from the book of the prophet Isaiah, that they may indeed look but not perceive, and may indeed listen but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. Christ then seems to be deliberately using parables in order to obscure knowledge. We would think that a parable or an illustration would actually make things easier, but in this case, it seems like Christ is deliberately using them in order to obscure some people from understanding what's really going on, because Jesus wants his disciples to be able to see past the mere perception, the illustrations, the visuals that Christ is using to the true heart of his message. Indeed, it's a frequent feature of all the Gospels that those in Christ's audience often can't see past the visual representations to the true meaning. But Jesus wants those that can see past the visual image, the visual perception to get to the real heart of the kingdom of God. You know, we had the same dynamic on Trinity Sunday with Nicodemus, where Jesus gives the illustration of the new birth, and and Nicodemus thinks it's about going to your mother's womb again. See, the trouble is, is that they're taking him literally, and he doesn't want disciples that will take him literally, but he wants disciples that can intuit the real knowledge of the kingdom of God. So in our passage this week, we get two very short parables. One, uh, at first, doesn't seem to be all that remarkable. Ooh, a farmer goes out and he plants some stuff and then he gets the harvest. You know, thanks for blowing our minds with some really deep stuff here, Jesus. You know, what what exactly is going on here? And I think the point of the parable is to notice the imperceptibility of the growth. Jesus said, you know, he says, you know, one day you just see it in its full form. And this is the experience of raising plants or or even raising children for that matter. You can, you know, just say, oh my goodness, how did you get so big? You can eventually see the growth, but you can't see it as it happens or how it happens. It's not perceptible, but eventually the results of the growth will be undeniable. Now, the second parable that we have, that of the mustard seed, a very famous parable, is a little bit more obscure, and we need some background from the ancient world to understand this. See, because a mustard seed does not grow into a big, enormous tree. In fact, the mustard seed was uh, very, very suspicious to a gardener because while it could be cultivated and it was grown and it was meant to be cultivated, the difficulty with it is it could take over the entire garden. In other words, it could be a very invasive shrub, essentially, that was almost like a weed that took over an entire garden. So you have to be very, very careful about how you grew it. Okay, so when we look at what the mustard seed becomes, we actually see in the parable that this is an agricultural impossibility. This does not happen to mustard seeds. They do not become these big, enormous, beautiful trees. They are meant to be invasive shrubs that take over an entire garden. There is growth, but what's Jesus getting at with this image of this tree that has branches and the birds nest in it? it? Well, in the ancient Israelite imagination, we see this in the prophet Ezekiel as well as in the prophet Daniel, a big, enormous tree with branches where the birds nest in it is the symbol of a prosperous kingdom, of a prosperous empire. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, we might start off really small, and we might seem like an invasive shrub that that takes over everything, but eventually the kingdom of God will grow to such an extent that it will rival that of any empire of the ancient world. Now, This is the short takeaway, of course, that we can take from this, is that while we may not even be able to see how the thing grows or what or, you know, how how it comes about or the steps along the way, but we see that its victory, its triumph will be clear for all to see. 
Now, speaking of things that we can't always see, despite years of academic biblical study under my belt, I never got this brilliant insight that St. Ambrose, the 4th century Bishop of Milan, and the mentor to St. Augustine saw in our parable of the mustard seed as it related to Christ. And with this, we will close. Its seed is indeed very plain and of little value, but if bruised or crushed, it shows forth its power. So faith first seems a simple thing, but if it is bruised by its enemies, it gives forth proof of its power, so as to fill others who hear or read of it with the odor of its sweetness. The Lord himself is the grain of mustard seed. He was without injury. The people were unaware of him as a grain of mustard seed of which they took no notice. Once again, thank you so much for coming here week after week. That is us all here for this week. Our overall short lesson for the season after Pentecost is, in the season after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit guides the church into all truth. And for the all truth this week concerning the kingdom of God, it is the imperceptibility of the kingdom of God's growth and its smallness. And we've seen this in a number of ways. We are not to assume that our vision of the kingdom of God is God's own. We are to pray that we will see the victory of God's kingdom, even if we may not see it now. We can be confident of our heart's knowledge of the kingdom of God, despite appearances of suffering. And we can trust that the kingdom of God will triumph, and it will be enormous for all though we cannot see its growth now. Once again, thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. All the links are below. And please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber. We really appreciate the support. We would like to continue doing this and we need to make a, a stronger income base in order to give more goodies in the future. So thank you so much for watching. We will see you here again next week as we continue to learn about the kingdom of God. Blessings to you.